here at the one and only legendary Power Monkey Camp. I'm here with the one and only Dr. Jamie Shear. How are you? I'm good, how are you? Um, and so for people on this webinar, we're just trying to film little impromptu discussions about uh, people who have helped me a lot learn more, mm -hmm. help people, and the most common thing I get from people are like, wow, you know a lot of stuff about a lot of stuff. And I'm like, yeah, but I have a lot of friends who are really smart. <laughs> so. Um, you are someone who uh, I value your opinion for many, many reasons. One is that you're just a really good human. Uh, and number two is that you're very intelligent in nutrition and a holistic point of view of how nutrition wraps into mental health and performance. And um, I wanted to just have a quick little chat about some sensitive issues in gymnastics around nutrition right now, mm -hmm. body image issues. Um, this is big tectonic change happening in terms of how we talk about this with kids. Um, and I also wanted to skew it by ending with some performance stuff because this is probably the one out of three foundational bases for how you perform at a high level. So that's why I wanted to have you here. Thanks for having me. Uh, no problem. Yeah. So can you give a quick little elevator pitch on you know your background and you know your role as a doctor and how that's maybe different than like people here doctor and they think like their local sports ortho who sure. helps with ankle fractures. So how are you a little different? Yeah, absolutely. So um, backstory is actually was a gymnast mm -hmm. my whole life yep. and sort of inspired the the nutrition and the health world. So I embarked on a nutrition career early on. Yep. We actually share a, an alma mater, yeah. Springfield College, yeah. which is a, pride. I think it just connects us. That's it. It's destiny. So um, <laughs> I did my uh, bachelor's in health and science and nutrition at Springfield, and then I was super interested in athletes. I went out to the University of Nebraska. Mm -hmm. I got a graduate assistantship to do my master's out there to work specifically with the athletes, with the female athletes, and then of course with the football team, just because cool. they're a beast out there. Cool. That was sort of my first introduction into sports nutrition. I really got to understand um, NCAA supplements and rules and regulations and learn about body composition and nutrition and at the, the sport and athlete level. And it was a little bit tumultuous for me. Yeah. I really did struggle um, with what I felt was important in health and then what was important in the political side of sport. Right. Which then drove me to medical school in a more holistic and integrative environment and I, got, I did a five-year medical degree in integrative and naturopathic medicine. That's sort of the background of it. Yeah. Um, and I think what where my practice is today is that I work with mostly athletes or people who are healthy mm -hmm. and well, mm -hmm. a lot of fitness, a lot of sport, a lot yeah. of in, in and around how can they live their best life. How sure. can they be mentally healthy, physically healthy, from a nutrition, performance, but not only nutrition and performance, like in their own life. How yeah. can they sleep better? Yeah. How can they have better relationships? How can they make sure that the things that they're eating are not just for you know performing that day, but yep. for generally speaking? Yep. That's sort of where I am now. Yeah. It's a it's an interesting time to be in the world of sport and fitness. I think that we are evolving into a world and a community that values health and mm. wellness and mm. prevention of illness and disease, and also is starting to look at the deeper level of important things, which is like, does this make us feel good? And yep. what is the culture around yep. this? Why did we yep. get into it? How yep. do we stay? Um, and then I think on top of all of that, we're in a different place in life right now with social media at the forefront of mm -hmm. how we receive our information. Yep. Fire hose of information. 20, 30 years ago, <laughs> you know, you got your information from your coach. Yep. And nowadays it's, I mean, there's just so many cooks in the kitchen, which is good and bad. And so yep. it's really difficult for coaches, parents, athletes to weed through all of that information. Yeah. And I think that, I mean, so we personally have done some work together, obviously from mm -hmm. camp and you've helped me a lot more just understand again, kind of that holistic aspect of this is not just about, you know, there's a lot of myths and misunderstandings right now about talking about nutrition and, and why certain things are important because we have, like you said, so many sources of information. Like you pick up a local magazine and you have somebody from somewhere who writes an article and you're yeah. like, okay, well, it's just telling science. you not to eat kale because it's going to slow your thyroid. And <laughs> yeah. it's like, wait, I thought kale was good. Exactly. And how do you even handle all of that? So you're like, is this good information? Is this bad mm -hmm. information? And I think that the other thing that's really hard is like, does this apply to me? Right? So I have seen a lot of times that we'll have uh, well-intentioned parents who are 30, 40, 50 years old and they're following nutrition advice from what their doctor tells them and they're applying it to their whole family. So now we have a, a 12 year old, yeah. gymnast or an athlete, let's just say anybody who's doing the same thing that a 40 year old postpartum mother is doing, Correct. you know, and it's like, okay, well, maybe those two things are applicable in different situations. You know, there's different styles for different things. A young kid who's growing needs something different than a, a mom, right? So what are your thoughts on that about, you know, the information, where do you find good information? And then also the differences between a young developing athlete and an adult. So Two or three questions in there, yeah, so I'll sorry. take them one at a time. Yeah, information um, first. Where do you find good information? <laughs> so, 
for me in my practice, the root of information is going to come from studies, right? Mm -hmm. I'm always going to check data and, and interesting things through, is there any studies on it? Do we have any research behind it? Where is this coming from? Who yep. backed this? How did this come yep. out? Why is this coming up, right? Great example right now is this immense number of people who are like, I need to be keto. It's going to yeah. help me lose weight, right? Yeah. This new keto diet, no, it's not new. It's, it's very, very, very old for the management of seizure, seizure disorders. So it's like, well, why is this coming up now? And mm. it's, you know, sort of the, the new way to look at like weight loss and anti-inflammatory mm -hmm. anti practices. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's great. Right. So I don't know if, you're, no. if you've recently read CNN, LeBron James diet, right? Yeah. It was everything about keto, but that doesn't mean that everybody who's trying to be a basketball player should follow keto. It's mm. actually quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have to think about where is this coming from and what's the motivational force behind it? Mm. Who's driving this mm. information? Where is it driving from? So for me, is whatever's being recommended completely outside of the box? Yeah. Is this taking you far away from what you innately know as yeah. something that was healthy and good? And if it is, then we have to think about why. Yeah. And the second piece of it is what's with the recommendation, right? So is it coming with some sort of... Um, driving force company supplement yeah. and thing like that and I think that's really easy to skew the population yeah. then I like to think about who's writing it right? mm -hmm. and, and there's plenty of people out there with a ton of knowledge and information but like what is their clientele and their access and do yeah. they have the experience within that group of people Are they so, in the trenches every day correct right. right so if someone comes to me and they're like you know I have Lyme's disease and I heard that you know there's really good holistic integrative things I'm gonna say yeah there is but I don't work with clients with right. Lyme regularly enough to be able to help you. Right, right. We need to get you to that person. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to think about the information that's coming out and where does it line up with all of the things in your life? Yeah. From a familial side of things, I think it's one of the detriments to athletes is when we try and match the individual athlete to a group of people who are not in that same mm. Uh, performance yep. standard. Mm -hmm. So I see a lot of, in, and I'm particularly in New York City, which is a different culture than a lot of places, but people who will take carbs away from their children because they don't want them to gain weight and then mm. not be you know, able to be the size of an appropriate gymnast mm. or they will put their child on only organic or clean, they can't mm. have any sugars mm. or they'll take them off of all dairy and all milk because they are sort of following this like clean and yeah. it can't, has to be clean and it has to have no sugar and it has to be anti-inflammatory. And that child is 12 years old with an incredibly high metabolism and need for calories, mm -hmm. not 45 years old trying to lose weight and yeah. manage a stressful yeah. lifestyle, right? <laughs> totally and so different. you can't take the mom and the child and put them on the same plan. Yeah. And I think that we have to think about who we are. I'm a mother of yeah. two children at yeah. home. It's really hard. Yeah. It's really hard to, to be a parent emotionally, physically. It's like, <laughs> yeah. it, wow, you worry all the time that you're doing something wrong. And then I think just from a time capacity, right? You're getting your child to sport, you're taking them different places, and you may or may not be working. Mm. Then to think about going home and having different meals for the child, for the parent, for the yep. other sibling who maybe has different needs. Yep. It, it takes a village. Yeah, it's, it's and I, I don't have kids. I'm not, mm -hmm. you know, I do coach 15 young female athletes, so I kind of see that point of view, but there's definitely a lot of plates to juggle and try to mm -hmm. keep everything spinning, and I think that's why it's so important that you, you network with people, and, and I always text you all the time, I'm like, what yeah. do you think about this? Or like Jay and, and Chris, I'm like, guys, what do you think about this? Can I help? And I'm, I think that's the hardest thing to do is to be, you know, really check your ego and be like, okay, I'm at the mm -hmm. edge of my information level. Um, you, you have to kind of allow somebody else to step in and help you. And I think that in most situations, like people can kind of fudge it a little bit. Like, oh, I don't know a lot about strength conditioning. I'll kind of learn as I go. Yeah. But this is something that's just so important in terms of the performance aspect, but in terms of like the things you say, the way you word food, the way you word if someone is, because let's, let's just be honest, gymnastics is an extremely demanding sport. You need to be very in shape and mm -hmm. fit yeah. to be safe, right? And that's, I think, where most coaches come from is like, I'm just trying to help you stay safe and be fit. And I notice that maybe you're not taking care of yourself. You're not feeling for performance. You're kind of just going for it you know and I think I understand that like I know as a coach that if someone's having a lot of injuries or is always tired you know you open this conversation about you know okay let's maybe talk about what you're eating and it's hard I mm -hmm. get it as a male as a male coach and a male yeah. medical provider it's hard but that being said if you don't like really take a moment to pause and be like okay I, I can I'm self-aware and I realize this conversation is going into talking about food that might lead to body image that might lead to all these other things be like okay am I the person who's best suited to have this conversation or not and it on the other side of it, is this something that has to happen with a parent present because the kid doesn't buy their own food? They don't go to the grocery store, they're 12, you know, they don't have the money to do that. So is this something that requires me, the coach, the athlete, and somebody else as a bigger conversation, not just a quick like, hey, by the way, you know. So I think it's, I think it's a team. Yeah, totally. I don't think any individual can do everything. Mm -hmm. 
And I think when we're looking at the fragility of a female or male athlete at 12 years old who's going to very quickly have changing hormones, that's mm. going to change body composition. Yeah. They're also trying to excel in a sport. They're also trying to go through school and manage their homework. And, you know, whether it's homeschooled or in school, like there's an incredible amount of stress yeah. to then bring in, um, oh, and you should be able to, you know, you should be eating better. And like, it's a really, that's a lot for a child, yeah. Um, yeah. whether you're 12 or, or 16. I think it takes a team. I don't think the parent can have the knowledge, like you're saying, to do all of that. I don't think the coach can either, right? Like, mm. I'm not going to coach gymnastics because it's not my wheelhouse. I don't know how to do mm. it. But I think the way that we can provide the most for our athletes is to make sure that exactly like you said in the beginning of this, which is you have people that you reach mm. out to. If I'm a if I'm a coach of a high level athlete, I need to make sure that on my team I have a therapist who I trust. When I see that my gymnast is struggling, I can send them over there to really understand what's going on like yep. what's underneath this and yep. I say this all the time like something is bothering me if something annoys me that doesn't normally if I'm having a bad day like what's underneath it yeah like, we really need to see like what's yeah. that trigger couple layers mm -hmm. so some there needs to be an, a sports psychologist and or therapist social worker not connected to the parents yeah not connected to the yeah coach. objective completely like a safe place I also think there needs to be somebody in knowledgeable in nutrition mm -hmm. That's not drawn by the trends. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. You know, like, there's nothing wrong with macros. Lots of people follow macros, but I don't mean hire a macro coach to put every single one of your gymnasts on macros. Right. I mean somebody that can look at the team and say, this individual gymnast needs this, and yeah. this individual gymnast yeah. doesn't. Yeah. Um, then you need, a, you know, some sort of sport and performance coach, trainer, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. So we're dealing with high-level athletes. Mm. I think you need a team. I yeah. just don't think we can operate in that one in that one fashion I also think that how we have social media and technology mm -hmm. those people don't all need to be yeah. right in your gym right you know financially right. you can be like oh, how am I gonna get this <laughs> yeah. but like, they don't need to be yeah. right I Consulting. mean you can there's therapy phone lines like mm. there's sports psychologists who can actually access your athletes you know so I just think that there's yeah. a lot of ways to do it but comprehensively as an owner a coach a physician a parent it's looking at what what do I need to yeah. support my child, my yep. athlete, yep. and that's yep. a team. Yeah, and yeah, that's awesome. And so, kind of moving from the, the those are kind of like really big, heady concepts about like you know you know the meta level of, of teamwork and stuff like that. But I really want to tackle two things that I see for my my ten to fifteen years coaching as an athlete, and even honestly as a male athlete who had this growing up. The there's just a few things that I see sparking a lot of problems in terms of like. A misunderstanding or a myth and then it turns into a much bigger festering issue down the road so one of which is we already talked about is like is carbohydrates and fats right people literally think that um, I should have salad and grilled chicken and vegetables all the time no matter what and in, in my world as I learned more about energy systems and performance and talking about like what fuels that 90 second full routine or that seven second sprint and we're gonna have Chris Henshaw on to kind of compliment this as well but like that's mainly driven by anaerobic glycolysis which is carb based right and it also like outside of performance, like your brain runs on fats and like that's how your myelin sheath is wrapped. And can you kind of touch upon, I guess, where you think this misconception came from and then maybe some some helpful tips for people that are maybe like, I thought carbs were bad. Like I've had gymnasts who literally have come to our gym and been like, I don't eat any bread and I, I don't eat any rice uh, because that's what I heard through social media or I heard from a magazine. And as soon as we educated them on why they needed it, their performance like literally through the roof, Skyrock, injuries yeah. completely plummeted. Because um, they were just literally dying, like dead energy. But 20 years ago, it was fats, right? Right. So fats nowadays, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. nowadays yeah. athletes don't want carbs and they don't want sugar. <laughs> yeah. But 20 years ago, I literally remember the snack in our break would be like those Snackwell's sugar-free, fat-free yep. cookies. And yep. it's like, well, there's no fat in them. Yeah. And I think it's the trend. I mm. think where this comes from is a culture of people who want results very quickly right. and they take great concepts and they think okay well let me move with that concept to get the quickest of the results the fastest where the carbohydrate fat part comes from is carbohydrate is a predominant fuel for storing yep. right so fat storage comes from carbohydrates and if you take out all your carbs mm. and you just eat proteins and fats AKA Atkins, yeah. a version of the ketogenic diet. Yeah. Your body doesn't have any resources to store fat, so you're going to naturally lean out. Right. Your body then also doesn't have any resources to have energy. Yeah. So if you choose to go that route, you have to know that you're doing it at the expense of your energy stores. Mm. And as an athlete, that means your performance. Right. And so when I work with athletes, it's really helping them understand like 
carbs don't make us fat and protein doesn't make our muscles bigger and um, fats don't necessarily make us fat. It's about understanding how these three macronutrients fuel the body. Gotcha. So I think it's fear mongering in yeah. some sense, like take the carbs out, yeah. it's going to make you fat, right? So totally. then what happens when we restrict? It messes with the brain. Right? So the mindset of restriction is a negative one. It reinforces negative behavior. Now we have fear of food. So not only do we restrict the carbs, but then we're fearful of eating other things. So mm. it's like, well, I don't eat carbs, but I also, I don't know, that's maybe too much um, fruit. I can't eat that much fruit. Yeah. And like, that, that looks like too much meat. And so what happens is this one concept of don't have spirals into this concept of restriction. Yeah. And all of a sudden I'm dealing with athletes who are barely eating anything. Yeah, with huge mental health repercussions and emotional well, because repercussions. your brain is starving. Yeah. I mean, you're overtrained and underfed. Yeah. And that's a disastrous way to be, but it's so much more disastrous in a child mm. whose metabolism is so fast. Mm. And now you're taking a child who has a fast metabolism and adding on three, four, five, six, seven hours of right. high intensity exercise. Right. The mother can take her carbs out and, and watch the sport yep. and be okay. Yep. and But like, it doesn't translate yeah. like that. I think we do a disservice early on. I, I mean, psychology 101 tells us that what we learn as a child is how we develop and it's how we see the world. Yeah. When you take an, a developing athlete at the prime and tell them not to have something, you place fear. You create this mind, this mindset that food is bad. Mm. Carbs are bad, mm. sugar is bad. Mm. And in that fear, then it's, it's going to sort of spiral. Mm. And they're going to be fearful of more foods. I love it. Yeah. And so I think especially when you, you th as coaches, as medical providers, as athletes, parents, we, mm -hmm. we kind of know these things in the back of our mind, but we struggle with how to make this understandable and how to phrase this with our kids when this conversation comes up. And so correct me if I'm wrong, but I've always talked to athletes about being like, Hey, the reason why uh, I'm, you may have heard this, but you know they say carbs are bad and fats are bad. But you know we're learning new things. You know things come out. We're kind of updating our ideas. And you know uh, one thing I think you got to realize, guys, is that you know the carbs and like the healthier forms of carbs, like that fuels you for performance. So if you're worried about mm -hmm. you know getting new skills and competing well, and you want to stay in good fitness shape because fitness is protective and you need to be in shape for gymnastics, right? You got to fuel yourself properly to do the work, right? And then we always talk about how like we love the work, we love the the process of training. That's like, that's why we're here. It's fun. It's hard. That's our community. Yeah. So I think when you spin it on the performance side of saying like, well, you need to put gas in your engine if you want to make it through this workout and have the energy to get through this hard routine and get through all this yeah. stuff. And I think that that mindset fires kids up a little bit. We're like, okay, now I, I want to take care of myself because I want to perform well. I want to hit my meets. I want to be able to train for four hours. I like training hard. It's fun. It's with my friends. And I think for people that are maybe thinking about, okay, how do I approach this topic? You know, maybe talk about like, hey, we're learning new things, but guys, you got to fuel your gas tank. And Josh Eldridge is a nutritionist. He's a friend of mine. He always says fuel for performance. We're trying to fuel you for performance. Mm -hmm. If your gas tank's on empty and you try to go across the country, you're going to you're gonna break down, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that there's a lot of moments when you don't hear about this until the kids are really tired all the time or they have a little bit of a nagging injury and you say like, hey, are you sleeping enough? Are you drinking enough water? Um, have you been going to bed early? And then, oh, by the way, like, are you snacking throughout the day with healthy food? Like, are mm -hmm. you getting some rice in there? Like, it's not about like, what are you eating? It's about like, hey, you don't look like you're performing well. Here are the six things that we have to make sure that the boxes are checked. Sleep, hydrate, exactly, right? Yeah. And I think that parents, medical providers, and coaches who are maybe gonna hear this can use that as an avenue or a vessel, you know? I think the three areas to have this conversation with children so that we don't create a fear-based perspective mm -hmm. on food is not all foods are created equal, Yep. right? So we can talk about fueling and talk about the right foods mm -hmm. and help them understand that sometimes it's getting rid of the, the foods that are not going to fuel us as well, right. even in the absence of words good and bad. Right. So if someone is like, well, I heard carbohydrates are bad and I don't want to have breads and this and that, we can just go back to the age old example of like, well, let's create a diet that looks super holistic and natural. Mm. What did people eat before there were Doritos? What mm. did people eat before there was kicks. Yep. Rice, grains, farro, barley, yep. vegetables, lots of fruits, meats, proteins, mm -hmm. right? So you don't have to restrict any of these things. These are our super healthy foods. And yeah. when we put them in there, they can feel your body really well. And children can understand, like if I will sometimes say to a child, like, where does a Dorito come from? And they'll be like, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. And I'll say, well, where did corn on the cob come from? Yeah. And they'll be like, you know, 
the ground. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, the Dorito is the times 100 version of the, you yeah. know, and sort of helping them understand the food process. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I don't think that's a restrictive thing. I think it's helping people understand mm. their food sources. Yeah. Have some corn on the cob. Totally. Eat some rice. That's very different than what it looks like processed down the, down the line. Mm. Um, but you need to do it with a very positive... Um, do you want me to stop? No, you're good. Okay. You need to do it with a, a positive spin on encouraging the healthy foods and not bastardizing the bad yeah. foods. Because yeah. then if the child is eating something that they don't think is good, now yeah. there's judgment, now yeah. there's fear. Yeah, and every time they sit down for dinner, it's like, or like they go out to eat with their friends, it's like they're staring at the menu, they're looking at like, oh, what am I going to eat? Like, and, and you they don't order. want that, yeah, right? It's, like, it's so, a very and, big spiral. So I'll say to my athletes, like, it's not the end of, if you just worked your butt off. Yeah. You can eat a slice of pizza. Yeah. You know, like, giving the kids some carbs it's gonna have some vegetables it does that's not the same as eating four slices of pizza <laughs> yeah, with yeah. you know a coke yeah. on the side yeah yeah i think the conversation has to be delicate you know it has to be the same way that we were going to conversate with children around other sensitive topics yep. Yep. I mean, you know you don't just sort of barrel through and be like don't eat that yeah and, yeah you know it's the same it's with the same level of intensity and the other one sorry to interrupt you but i see it too in a group setting like mm-hmm. like having that in practice is yeah. <laughs> like that's what i see is people like in a lineup they're like don't do this and don't do that and then one person's like oh my god everyone's looking at me you know it's like that's so scary yeah it's yeah. I also there's two other areas where I think you know you talked about like you can't drive a car if it doesn't have fuel in it yeah. my goal is to teach every child how to eat healthy mm-hmm. and to how to understand the balance between yeah. healthy right so yeah. if we're talking about my own children and they're like I want dessert I'm like sure you have to finish all the spinach on your plate yeah and have your chicken first yeah right and yeah. then once, because they had no problem eating the pasta. Yeah, yeah, but like, yeah. They're like, I don't want, you know, yeah. like, the balance is this, right? Yeah. And I think, so I think that teaching children balance, whether, you know, we're setting them up to be able to budget their money down the road, yep. or we're setting them up yep. to be able to understand when they're overtrained and need to take a break. Yeah. When we're setting them up to understand, like, I need to eat something healthy because yeah. I've had a lot of things that aren't great. Yeah. It's not about making them fearful of food. It's about helping them to understand what balances. Yeah. And then you said something about driving a car, and I mean, this is more for the parents and the physicians on the call, not necessarily the children, because I definitely didn't know anything about gas before I had my license. <laughs> yeah. But like, you don't put 89 in a Mercedes. Yeah. And you don't put 93 in a very low-end model car. Right. right. To drive a car with an optimal engine, if you want to drive a very high-end, high-functioning, fast car with a very incredible engine, you have to put very clean, very good fuel in there. Mm-hmm. You don't get to put fuel that's mixed with some other yep. things. Yep. That concept is not very different. Like if you want your body to function at its best, you've got to put the best in there. Yep. And the best does not mean restrict. The best means making sure quality. that we're balancing the mm-hmm. quality of the yep. food. Yeah, and I think that this kind of comes into the next, the big, again, misunderstanding, and we've already kind of touched on it before, is like um, many, many people think, okay, they get past the carb and the fat thing. And the next thing logically is when I'm like, I don't, I'm not lean enough, I'm, I don't feel energy enough, it's like, I'm just gonna pull back on how many calories I'm eating. I'm just gonna, mm-hmm. I'm gonna shave off whatever, 500 here and there, I'm just gonna go for a salad and not like that. And I think that's where I see a lot of problems come up with um, the female athlete triad and also with what they call now is red S syndrome is like, people just literally think less is better. They think if I eat less, I'll lean out and I'll feel lighter and I'll, and maybe it's not malintentioned, it's not that someone's trying to hurt someone it's that they they realize that for sports and high level performance you have to be pretty lean and pretty fit and muscularly balanced and I think that that's a big problem because people restrict their calories and they lose muscle mass and they lose energy and they can't get their training hard what are your thoughts on um, I guess concerns about that of what that does to a young kid but also about how do people approach how do you tweak your diet or how do you tweak what you're eating for fueling yourself if you do want to perform optimally and not hurt somebody you know so I think the first thing that we need to do is um, to separate athletes because I think, you know, if you have a child who's maybe 15 pounds over their optimal weight mm. as a gymnast mm. and a child who's at their optimal weight as mm. a gymnast, yep. you can't have this conversation together. Mm. You don't know what's going on in the family structure, what's going on during their day, yep. what they're eating. Yep. You know, we know that a lot of children learn how to nurture pain and emotion through food. So what's happening in a child whose weight is starting to move out of a place where we can't control it or it's not healthy or it's against the grain for the sport? Is there a deeper issue? Do they not want to be in the sport? Is something happening at home? Is there a stress? 
So if you're seeing a trend that's not just like, oh, well, they'd perform better if they were stronger, but if you're actually seeing where you need to make like anthropometric changes, they yeah. need to actually lose weight yeah. or lose fat, that's the team approach. Yep. Don't take that one on yourself. Yep. If you have the athlete who's like a little bit too tired, they're not normally that way, you're noticing a change, they're not eating well, they just started the ninth grade and high school's yeah. intimidating, and they don't have time <laughs> to eat lunch. Nothing's that's going where, well. <laughs> right, like that's where you as the coach can be like, hey, let's have a conversation. Yeah. You know, like, what time is your lunch period? Are you eating snack before you get to the gym? What's, right. That's a different conversation than the athlete who is trending towards a changing body, maybe yeah. hormones are setting in, yep. we're seeing some overweight tendencies Puberty. and or yeah. underweight yeah and i think you're hurting both extremes yeah if you try to challenge those all together yeah furthermore i think when we think about you know our ds or reds yep, yep, yep. versus female athlete triad like none of these are single component right. syndromes multifactorial what is going on with the hormones what's going on with the genetics yeah. look at what we can do these days with genetics yeah. right like are you taking somebody who comes from a predominantly endomorph family mm -hmm. with the entire family looks a certain way and yep. eats a certain way and now you're trying to put them yep. into the ectomorph and maybe this is the first person in gymnastics in their family or and sports. guess what now they can't <laughs> identify with anybody that they've spent their entire life with yep. so you've alienated them from their family but you're pulling them closer to their team mm -hmm. I think that there's a greater um, responsibility from us as the adults in the world to understand that children don't have the skills for this. Yeah. I also think we have to be careful because um, we want the best for our children and sometimes we confuse the best with the desire. Mm. Like the child wants to be the best gymnast and so we as a parent want to do everything we can to help them be the best gymnast. Right. And truthfully speaking, sometimes you then join the child in making decisions that are not the best for themselves. Yeah. These are really hard conversations to have. Very you know, challenging. To pull a, child, a pull parent to the side and say, like, we get, this isn't the right way to do it, yeah. you know, is challenging yeah. in, in many ways. But I think ultimately what we need to start thinking about is when we're healthy, how do we maintain that? What do mm. we teach to facilitate health? Mm. I know as growing up as a gymnast, this wasn't taught in the beginning. Yeah. It wasn't a found a pillar. Yeah. It was like it didn't come up until one of the gymnasts got too big or too small. Yeah. And yeah. then all of a sudden it was like, oh, all of a sudden you're weight, having the conversation. Right? Yeah. It was never, it was never preventative. Yeah. It was never a pillar. Yeah. I don't think I ever had somebody come in and talk to us about healthy eating as a gymnast. Right. It was only like, oh, I remember they weighed her and she was overweight and then she had to go yeah. talk about nutrition or this one started starving and like. So you're not doing anything until it's a problem. Yeah. If we don't change that, if we don't start doing things before it's a problem, it's always going to be associated with a problem. Yeah, yeah. I think it's such a backwards model. Yeah, that's that's very well put. And I think, I mean, this is, this is clearly the biggest issue in gymnastics right now is a lot of coaches are getting chastised and called out because their main way of tracking performance was by weight. Literally Absolutely. standing standing on a scale. Oh, I remember and that. I'm doing sure that. you do too. And like. there's many people, and, and I want to definitely say early on that from a, a male gymnastics point of view and a female gymnastics point of view, it used to be that you go to competition, you see these girls that are ripped and they're like mm -hmm. doing stuff. But now what's happening, and this is what I see in the 13 to 15 year old girls that I coach, is social media has become such a painful, painful toxic, just hate spewing platform for young kids to do it and so what they do is they scroll through instagram they see this person in a bathing suit and then the guys go on they see these like male gymnasts and they're like shredded right and they're like god i don't look like that right and so what happens is that if if coaches get on this unfortunate you know maybe they're not malicious they're not trying to make people feel bad but they're trying to say like okay well we need to like make you perform well and safely and weighing them used to be everything that was like the go-to thing and personally from what I've learned from you and the people is I tend to again try to build it in the culture about like we always talk about mm -hmm. our goal is to stress recover adapt get stronger come every mm -hmm. day do the work right and the way that we measure that is through journaling how do you feel how tired are you one to ten how much did you sleep and if we start to see trends that move towards low energy low performance the conversation has already been opened up about our culture about like hey are you recovering enough are you mm -hmm. taking care of yourself are you sleeping enough are you doing your schoolwork before practice so you can go to bed at home and I think that's step number one but I think step number two is, like, what do you what do you give for advice to coaches or parents or medical providers who maybe do see uh, a problem with energy, but like they know that like weighing somebody is going to have horrific consequences? Like, what should they be looking for as signs about like, okay, we need to have a conversation about how the athlete's taking care of themselves. So, I want all coaches and parents and and even physicians on the team mm. to apply a principle to every single gymnast. 
not to just the ones that are struggling. Right. right? Which is right. like, you know, your goal setting sheets yep. or your programming, whatever. Like every single gymnast comes in and they have, there's a sleep box, a, a food box, a mm -hmm. homework box, a family box, yeah. a stress yeah, yeah. box. And you don't wait to do that until you see a problem. It's, so it's not weird. It's not like this Correct. brand new conversation. And I do this in my office with symptom checkers, mm. right? When people come in for an initial visit, they fill out a symptom questionnaire and they put a number to it. Yeah. And so then in six months I can say, you know what? Your acne was a seven then. Yeah. Now you have it as a three. So you're you're fixated on that you still yeah. have it. Yeah, yeah. But when we actually go back and check it, mm. pretty significant improvement. Mm. Because we can't think of then. We can only think of now. Yeah. I can only think of the girl on Instagram who I can't think of, wow, where I came from, what yep. I looked like yep. six months ago. Yep. And so I think we have to, it goes back to that like parenting and and growing and educating, which is like, Start this from the beginning. Every mm. every gymnast who makes the team, mm. right? So one of my little girls was just asked to be on the gymnastics team, and that means she gets to go two days a week, mm. and she gets to... Mm. Well, before that happens, part of getting on that team should be like, and here's our team question. Here's our team journal. Yeah. Here's the things that we want to look at throughout yep. your progress of your year. Every yep. three months, how are you sleeping? How are yep. you eating? How is your family? How are you... Do you have friends? Yeah. yeah. And now it's normal. Yeah. Right? We didn't make a weird culture or a we've got to have a conversation Stigma around about it, yeah. your food, right? Yeah, so yeah. like the natural progression of that feels safe and mm -hmm. it feels okay. And if we can create a safe place for gymnasts, they're gonna thrive and be more likely to tell us. Yeah. Right? A child in a family who feels safe is going to thrive versus a child who's afraid of saying something. And this is their family. A gymnast who's in the gym three, four, five hours a week a, a day, five or six days mm -hmm. a week. That's their family. Yeah, yeah. They need to feel safe. They need to feel uh, they, they can communicate. Mm. I remember the idea that you can't communicate certain things to your coaches because mm. of how rigid and straight. Like, that's yep. so dysfunctional. Yeah. If I'm with you four hours an afternoon every single day, I want to be able to say to you, like, hey, Coach Dave, there's somebody in school that's bothering me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. And that's why I can't hit this, mm. you know, layout. Yeah. Like. There needs to be that. And, and it's always been like this fear-based model of like the coach and the sort of the... the dictator. Yeah. yeah. I think it's a bad way for us to introduce children to discipline and sport um, because it sets them up for like, we have so much to hide. We have to keep this in. We shouldn't, yeah. it shouldn't be a problem. We shouldn't talk about yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. Why um, me? Yeah. And so if we can create that from the beginning, a yeah. normal conversation, are you eating healthy? Check. Are you sleeping? Check. Are, you mm. know. And then I also think that social media is a challenging tool mm. and if we can get on it early and we can teach people how to use it as an inspiration and not a comparison mm -hmm. or negativity mm -hmm. right so let's let's sit together let's go through your instagram who are you following yeah right yeah does this person make you feel good does yeah this person make you feel bad yeah because if you're looking at something and feeling bad we need to unfollow them yeah and if you're looking at this gymnast because she just got your Jenko and you're so excited to get yours and you're inspired by yeah. it, we're going to keep following her. Yeah. If everybody that comes up on your Instagram feed, and I'm just using Instagram, yeah. Yeah. makes you feel jealous yeah. and bad, yeah. it's time to redo that filter Yeah. because you're constantly flooding your brain with negative thoughts. Mm -hmm. You can't fight the social media giant. You're not going to get all of these children yeah. off of Instagram and Snapchat and Facebook yep. and all of these. Yep. You're not going to get them off of it. Yep. You're gonna alienate them if you do. Mm -hmm. But if we can teach them how to use it in mm -hmm. a positive way mm -hmm. and shut it down 90 minutes before bed. Yep. You cannot go to sleep looking at somebody yeah. who makes you feel like crap yeah. Yeah. and then go to sleep. And then, and also, you know, what are the tools for inspiration, right? Like I'm sure like most gymnasts have a, well, we used to have like an inspirational board and yep. you put your picture of your yeah, favorite, yeah. Fam yep. favorite gymnast. Um, but now they're doing that through social media. So what does that look like as yeah. a coach or as a parent? Like, what are you inspired by? Let yeah. me take a look at it. Let mm -hmm. me make sure it's not somebody who's 30 pounds thinner than you mm -hmm. or so, you know what I mean? Like you can learn a lot from the things that a child is interested in. And in a non-invasive way, a coach, a parent, a doctor can talk to a child about those things. I ask my kids all the time that come into the office, like, you know, do you follow anybody? Do you watch anybody make recipes? Mm -hmm. Is there anybody on Instagram? Like, Learning what inspires somebody tells you a lot about where they are. Yeah, I mean, there's so many good things you said in there, and I think that a lot of this comes down to really 
that model of fear-based leadership and I'm the expert, you do what I say, what that does is that breaks trust and that breaks um, a safe environment, right? That it breaks fear, absolutely. It does. And so I think that there's a really great book called The Culture Code. And one thing yes. they talk about is that the best way that the highest performing athletes and coaches succeed is because they have established and they, it's not passive. They work on it every single day. They work to build a, a community that is trustful and open and there's radical transparency and they're not afraid to have the harder conversation when it's the right thing to do. And I think that that as the foundation for this entire discussion about nutrition is probably more important, right? And Absolutely. Um, it took us five years to work on that in our gym about not making it weird to talk about recovery and not talking about what we're doing and then journaling and talking about that. But like these little, like they call them micro, micro habits, right? So like little things come up here and there and you nip them in the butt right away. Somebody says an offhanded compliment about weight or something like that and you guys are like, hey guys, like that's not cool to talk about that. Yep, like nope. exactly, it's like not even a, it's not weird, it's just part of the thing and everybody kind of gets on that cultural rapport. So if you start there as a coach and you really establish that we're in this together, this is this is all of us helping you. And I think what's really hard for coaches to do is again, have those moments of self-awareness and check yourself, be like, okay, so starting to call, this conversation is dipping a little bit into a, a dicey territory, I gotta really watch myself here or whatever it is, but also is, you can't be afraid to allow yourself to be criticized as a coach, as a medical provider, as a parent. And I, we have a radical transparency policy in our gym where it is completely fair game to talk about anything at all times, right? Obviously, if there's private conversations that are more female related, they go with the female coaches in a sure. private setting. But um, the girls are allowed to call me out whenever I'm doing something that I didn't say. Like maybe I said, like, we're doing this conditioning. And I said, guys, one more round. They're like, you said five rounds and this is six. I'm like, okay, my bad. Like they're allowed to call me out for being a jerk and that takes a lot of humility takes a lot of self-awareness, but you have to realize that it takes so much work to build trust, it takes a microsecond to break trust, and you never have it again. So if you let one comment slip out about like, hey, you're looking a little heavy right now, or you let Done. one thing slide out about like, girls, look in the mirror, look look who's thin right now, which happens all the time. And this is not, this is not like a, a facade that I've heard these real things happen. The moment you do that, all of the athletes are gonna resent you behind your back, they're gonna be bitter, they're gonna gossip about you, and you've lost all of them, not to mention you've probably hurt someone significantly exactly and that also just goes back to social media right yeah. like is your athlete hashtagging finspo yep. and only looking at people right so like we learn a lot from that i think you know as you're talking about like i mean predominantly i'm i'm more into the fitness and mm -hmm. uh maybe less child athlete in my in my physical office in the city but one of the things that happens in the first visit is someone will come in and i'll be like do you have a bowel movement every day and mm -hmm. they're like or no. Yeah. And I'm like, well, tell me about it. Yeah. And it's like, talk to you about my poop. <laughs> right? Like, and then they'll be like, well, I know this is gross. I'm sorry. I don't mean to. And I'm like, no. From the very first moment, if I don't know what's going on with your gut, it can't help you with yeah. your health. Yeah. So this is an open ended conversation. Yeah. You can tell me as much as you want yeah. about your bowel habits. Yeah. And, yeah. and I don't want it to feel weird. I'm going to ask you if you don't tell me. We're going to talk about this because it has to be established early on that, like, for me to know that your gut is functioning as healthy as it is, I have to know how it's functioning. Yeah. And it's just an example yeah. of like conversations that we feel as shy or yeah. bashful or like. But once you get past that, the next conversation oh, about please, something is not as bad. They open up and walk in yeah. and like, so. And, you know, and, like, um, and I think that it is, it's building that trust. Yeah. And, you know, it's really hard for adults as well. Yeah. Because we're conditioned to be a certain way. And we have to work really hard to remember that we're now working with children who we don't want their way to be our way. Yeah. We're trying to yep. reverse different this goals, culture. different background. You have to really tap into not challenging the things in your own self that maybe not yeah. are healthy or maybe are bad representations of what we're trying to change. Yeah, and so this is back to the social media thing and, and honestly this is this was personally for me this was something really hard that I struggled with as an athlete when I was growing up. But this is something that I, I take fifteen minutes out of the week and we have whiteboard lessons where it's it's about like bigger picture guys, empathy and compassion mm -hmm. and, and mindset and stuff. And one thing I, you know, when you really look at social media and a lot of people have looked at this through psychology research now is, is many times social media is a highlight reel. It's a highlight reel of what they think they want to represent as their image, photoshopped and edited and all that stuff. And so I tell the girls, I say, I say, man, think about what is going on behind the screen in that person's mind. And I'm, I don't judge anybody. I say, girls, we don't judge anybody. You know, everybody has their own life circumstances. But when somebody puts a picture up of them, you know, in their in the mirror with their abs and blah blah blah. Like what it looks like is uh, is like wow, I can't believe how fit they are. But really, what's going on is like guys, I'm really hurting inside. I'm struggling. I'm I'm insecure. I need validation. Like this comment, this tell me I look good, right? And everybody and like everybody has that. 
Everybody has that. Well, judgment is a reflection of our own insecurity. Exactly. Always, right? Like, my therapist taught me this early on in therapy where I'd be like, you know, pointing something out on someone else and she'd be like, all right, turn the finger. Yeah. And let, what's triggered? Yeah. Why are you triggered by that person who you don't even know? Yeah. What about that person just ignited within yes. you? And, yes. And when did you give your power away? Yeah. Because you just gave your power to somebody you don't even know. Yeah. Take it back and let's figure it out, right? And that's a higher concept. You're not going to maybe translate that yeah. to a 12 year old. Yeah. But you find ways to, which is like, yeah. you know, we are triggered by our own insecurities. Mm-hmm. And then we project it out there to feel better. Yeah. And that's why Instagram and social media is a really dangerous place. That's why it's so popular, though. Absolutely. Yeah. Because we're drawn to uh-huh. what we can't escape, uh-huh. right? This is this is our pattern. And I think it's a really interesting um, place for us as coaches and doctors and, and parents to say, like, okay, well, what's going on over there? Like, yeah. you know, you're, you're constantly following all these girls with abs. Like, let's talk about you. Yeah. Like, how does this make you feel? Yeah. What does this look like? Yeah. What, you know? It's it's an opportunity for conversation if we use it in the right way. Yeah, and there's two there's two really big things that I always try to teach the athletes that have been really helpful for me is is one the concept of what you can and what you can't control, and I think that's huge, right? And I I, tell, I mean you can't control what someone does, you can't control if they you know spew hate at you in the comment section, but you can control your actions and your reactions to that. You can control who you unfollow. You can control you know not to use social media in a negative light and things like that. And I think that's really powerful for athletes because as soon as you lose that sense of control people really, really panic and it kind of has a big spiral effect. So I think that concept of control is something that I've learned from a lot of people here that's really helpful. But also, you have to you have to teach the athletes about like, like what do you, like? and this can happen on their own, this can happen in a journal, not with the one-to-one, but I'm like, what are you really scared of? Like, like what really makes your brain start to do some wacky things? And like maybe that's a meet, maybe that's like failing in front of a, an a audience. Move or, right, yeah. so it could be, like, yeah, but a lot of times when people get down to it, they're like, I'm scared of not being good enough. I'm scared of disappointing oh. people. I'm scared of whatever right and when you really help teach the athlete about like you don't need to tell me they have a private journal for this at our gym i say you need to write down and you need to really understand about like what makes me what makes my stomach drop and what makes me scared because that root is probably a reflection of why you're following those people or why you're Absolutely. giving yourself so if you give those two filters of what am i scared of, what am i terrified of right i tell the girls i'm number one scared of, i'm scared of regret and i'm scared of being alone those are the, like nothing else in this world mm-hmm. scares me more than those two things i'm scared of coaching you for 10 years and having 10 years down the road we meet and he's like, yeah, by the way, I hated you for 10 years because you were an awful human and uh, you treated me like crap. And I'm like, wow, like that fear of regret motivates me every day. And then that's built on top of like, okay, well, if I'm, I'm scared of regret and I'm scared of that, I'm going to work as hard as I can in practice to, to be a good person. I'm going to try to wake up every day and, and build myself up through education and have harder conversations with the girls. But when the girls feel that empowerment or the guys, they feel that empowerment of like, I'm scared of falling in the meat and disappointing my parents. Okay, so now they can build that onto like, okay, well, maybe that's why I act certain ways. Maybe that's why I follow these people. And that's why I'm restricting my food and why I'm trying to be skinny and why I'm trying to do this because I want to be lean and I want to do this and I want to compete well. But when you dig through those layers, you're like, okay, well, now we understand if you're scared of falling, let's have a conversation about how you actually need fuel for performance and you got to train hard to not fall and blah, blah, blah. Right. And also, by the way, we love you no matter what happens. And, and also <laughs> we learn from our fall. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Reframing you know, you're, that. You're fearful of regret. Well, the only way to handle regret if it comes is to learn from it. Mm-hmm. And therefore, you don't regret it because mm-hmm. you spun it, right? Totally. So it's like if you're afraid of gaining weight so that, you know, so that your coach doesn't accept you or you don't make the team or you can't get your move, like, okay, well, let's think about what would cause you to gain weight mm-hmm. and how do we spin that healthy, mm-hmm. right? Like, mm-hmm. you're going to gain weight if you starve yourself because your metabolism is going to slow down. Yeah. You're going to gain weight if you choose to only eat foods that don't fuel your body correctly. Yep. But if that's your fear, why don't we build a really strong foundational diet yeah. with good foods yep. and good exercise and supplements so that you don't have to worry so much in the fear world about that because yeah. we've got that covered, yeah. right? And it's like we fear what we don't know. We fear what we fear can't Fear of uncertainty. Get to. We fear what we can't tell, you know, and mm-hmm. so the coach, the parent, and the doctor needs to help the child with that. Yeah. Those are skills that a 12-year-old doesn't know how to look underneath the layers, yeah. you know? Yeah. I mean, even the most super intuitive, well-aware children still don't peel layers the same way because they haven't had the life experiences. Yeah. But you can help them. Yeah. And then they can have what we just talked about before, which is feeling safe. Mm-hmm. Wow. My coach or my nutritionist helped me build this because this is going to make me healthy. Yeah. And then they're confident, right? Yeah. And so now we can start to move away from following the, the fear-based model of it. The fear-based model isn't going to work. Nope. Um, and it's very toxic. 
I'm it's, very toxic. It's also a snowball. Yeah. It's it's the diet snowball, yeah. right? Like you stop having carbs because somebody tells you you're bad, but then all of a sudden you're now you're starving because you don't have carbs. So then you're like, oh my god, I'm so hungry, yeah, but I yeah. can't eat all this meat. So then yeah. you stop having meat. Yeah. Like it's this concept of of feeling like you can't get a hold of it. Yeah. And that's what's happening is it's just spiraling out of control. You know, when people ask me questions about a few times this morning here. At famous power monkey cow um people were like well how many calories do i need to add if i'm exercising five times a week yeah i'm like i don't know yeah. what are you eating yeah i have no idea how many uh, calories you should add because i don't know what you're eating yeah. well i work out five days well what do your workouts look like yeah. because maybe some of them are yoga maybe mm. some of them are you know Less uphill intense, sprints yeah. like we all want a quick answer yeah i i want a quick answer sometimes yeah. right you know how do i do this but like there's there's foundations that need to be built it goes back to those pillars and i think where gymnastics got so out of control was that rigid one person just with one methodology mm -hmm. that was like you're not allowed to have emotion you're not allowed to be human mm -hmm. you're not allowed to gain weight or, or lose weight you're not allowed to have tears you're not allowed to cry like everybody should cry yeah all humans should cry multiple times a week mm. it's good to know that we can feel yeah it doesn't mean cry over everything but like yeah. This this rigidity of like no crying, no eating, no this, yeah. no that coming from yeah. one person, like it's a fear based yeah. model. Yeah. So man, there's so much good stuff in here. We could talk for hours, but I think we gotta actually get to the next station. <laughs> <laughs> but so what are just um like maybe one or two of like your best advice? Like where do people start? Because they're not nutritionists, they're not with a medical background. Like mm -hmm. me, there's like the everyday parent, the everyday coach, the person who just wants to help. What do you suggest for them as like the next actionable step for them to kinda have, okay, where do okay. I find new information yep. or something like that? So I'm gonna give you sort of Three to five just perfect tools first. Perfect. Before next step. One, stay hydrated. Yep. Right. How many athletes do not drink enough? Got my friendly new flask here from Power Monkey. Seriously, yeah. I know. <laughs> but like especially children. Yep. They go through three hours of practice, they have one ten minute water break because yep. they don't want to break to have to go pee and all yep. like you gotta stay hydrated. Yep. Um it's the fastest way to injure, in my opinion, and yep. to be really fatigued is to be dehydrated. Yep. It's I mean you, you'll die very quickly without water, <laughs> yeah. you know, but the yeah. body can find ways to make fuel. So really staying hydrated. Um, children need to eat a balanced diet. Okay. Children can have sugar. Yep. Children can have protein. Children yep. can have carbohydrates. Children yep. can have fats. I think this idea of pulling out one macronutrient yeah. is really unhealthy yep. in a child yep. unless you know metabolically there's a yeah. very Medical specific reason. Specific, yeah. Do not pull a macronutrient yep. out of a yep. child. So just to review, proteins, fats, and carbs yep. are your macros, and then water or fluid for hydration. Never pull one of those okay. out. You can tweak them. You can change them. Do not take your child off of carbs. Do not take your child off of fats mm. or protein. Mm -hmm. um, make sure that your child is sleeping. Yep, huge. Right? And if your child's not sleeping, that means you need to find out yeah, why. Instagram late at night. <laughs> is it, right, is it yeah. social media, is yeah. it stress, yeah. is it underfed, is yeah. it, right? There's so many things that we can do. It doesn't mean start them on Tylenol PM just because you want to see if mm. you right? Like, let's do some really good work to understand. So mm -hmm. we need to drink, we need to eat, we need to sleep. Mm -hmm. We also need to remember, like, what's beautiful about each one of us is that we're different. Mm -hmm. I wish I could give everybody listening the blueprint yeah. of what to do. The handbook. I wish I could say, <laughs> yeah. do this. Yeah. But that would take away from who we are as individuals. Yes. Right? So every single person I work with, I say, Does there, is there a food, and we did this together, mm -hmm. that doesn't make you feel good? Mm. Right? Mm. Artichoke is a super healthy food, and every time I eat it, I feel very ill. Yeah. That's a key for me not to eat that. Mm -hmm. Right? I think everybody needs to take a look at, like, wow, am I? do I even know myself well enough to know, yeah. like, this food doesn't make me feel good. If you eat a bagel in the morning, are you fatigued and exhausted afterwards? But if you have an English muffin with peanut butter, you feel good. Like, mm. pay attention. Yeah. Stop shutting down and just going through, and let's pay attention to who we are. What makes us feel good? What makes us happy? What makes us sad? What makes us cry? What makes us tired? What makes us awake? Mm. Um, so eat well. Don't take macronutrients out. Hydrate. Sleep. Pay attention to how you feel, yeah. right? Like you said, the journal Journaling. symptom about how Huge. you feel. It's not just how you feel like emotionally about your, you know, your move, mm. but how you feel in the world. Yeah. Um, and then I think probably one of the greatest assets we can give to children is to teach them how to communicate. Education is huge, yeah. Teach them how to communicate, teach them how to learn and to speak. And like, 
communication is such a key and a vehicle yeah. to relationships, and yeah. that's where they learn. So to learn more, um, not social media. Yeah. I think there's some really good, uh, is it Nancy? I forget her name. She has a really good uh, like athletic performance book. I forget her last name, but she has a really good like handbook. It's just like lay terminology kind of stuff. Josh Eldridge has a great book mm-hmm. called "Because She's Worth It." You know, Stacy Sims has a great okay. book. Okay. Roar. Yep. For oh yeah, yeah. Athletes. I've heard that. I've heard that. She really talks about female specifically, so not gotcha. for male athletes. Yep. Um, but there's also just some basic guidelines that are out there from the IOC yeah. and some other stuff that are not, you know, they're filtered through a good lens. But it's just education and communication really is what it comes down to, right? I think it. I think it starts with us as individuals, yeah. and as you know, um, as a parent, reaching out to the resources near you and making yeah. sure. Yeah. You know, there's not people ask us all the time. Is there one book? Is there <laughs> yeah. one good book? I wish. Like, <laughs> I how? wish. Yeah. How? You know, it's one good book. For, I could write the good book for Dave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we, you know, we know what's good for you, but yeah. that's going to be such, such a different book than what's good for me. Right. So just understanding principles and foundations. That's great. And just tap into, you know, what what drives us, yeah. what makes us do this, and who we are, because. No matter how good your diet is, no matter how good all your resources are, if you don't feel good as a human. Yeah, you're not going to follow through on it. Yeah. Well, this is amazing. Thank you so much. I think people can get a lot of value out of this. I appreciate all your work and being such a good person. So I'm going to let everyone digest this and then maybe down the road do another one. Let's do it. Cool. Maybe tack out some more specifics on nutrition, yeah. which is hard. Yeah, game you know. plans and stuff. But there's a lot of, there's some ground level tactics that apply to everybody we could cover. Yes. But first, they need to eat. Three different macronutrients, drink some water, get some sleep. Yeah, basics first. (laughs) Basics. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, Jamie.